up to today, we have studied uh, some fundamental applied aerodynamics and uh, uh, started uh, the theoretical section in our fundamental concepts. There are two parts we need to cover in the theoretical session. Uh, one is the sensitivity analysis and the flow regimes. Right, so we'll finish that today. We have already derived uh, the Mach number being actually the squared Mach number being a fundamental uh, non-dimensional number, right? That characterizes how the density in the flow is sensitive to a proportional change in velocity. All right. So basically, d rho over rho is equal to minus Mach squared times du over u. All right. Uh, so we already got a homework uh, due yesterday, right? Uh, that analyzes that and. Uh, uh, we'll actually exercise that uh, even a little bit more uh, during this week's homework. We're also in the middle of deriving the Reynolds number, another very important non-dimensional number in aerodynamics. That has to do with the effect of viscosity, right? Remember, when we are deriving the Mach number, we ignored viscosity. We assume the viscous forces are not significant. And uh, in deriving the Reynolds number, we are now assuming that the Mach number is insignificant, right? The, the, uh, basically, the pressure doesn't change. The flow is just uh, flowing uniformly at low Mach number. And then we are in the process of deriving the Reynolds number, all right? In looking at how a boundary layer is evolving as we are moving downstream. So we'll finish that a look at what are the flow regimes and then start the second part of our theoretical fundamental concepts that is uh, flow kinematics and uh, especially we'll look at vorticity and uh, the associated uh, circulation and how they move and that becomes the basis for our incompressible potential flow section which we will do next right where we are really going to introduce uh, like what is the mechanism for lift what is the mechanism for drag that's uh where we are we are going next okay so uh today we are going to again look at this boundary layer we looked at on monday right so first of all uh to review some of the things we went through on monday we're assuming the velocity is proportional to the distance to the wall inside the boundary layer so that's basically the red line over here right so at the wall the velocity is zero at the at the outer edge of the boundary layer the velocity is u infinity it's not affected by the existence of the wall and within the boundary layer, between the wall and the edge of the boundary layer, we are assuming the simplest possible scenario, a linear velocity profile. Okay, and if you have time and the re if, you, if you actually do it at, at your home, right, you can actually assume a different profile. The result is going to be exactly the same, no change. Okay, so if you, if you read Anderson's book, you're also going to see that uh, the real boundary layer is not a linear profile but something called a Blasius profile right I mean it doesn't ha it doesn't have any analytic expression but you have a very simple ordinary differential equation that describes that profile okay and uh, basically no matter what the profile is uh, you can go through the same derivation and come with the exactly the same conclusion okay now, uh, with the linear profile, of course, uh, uh, it saves a lot of calculus. Yes? So are you recording this? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you for remind, uh, reminding me. I, I am recording this. So, yeah, uh, we'll have a video. Thanks. Yeah, let's do that uh, every time. Okay. Uh, yeah, it saves a lot of calculus. Uh, basically, the tau, the viscous force or uh, skin friction at the wall, is per unit area is just equal to the viscosity times u infinity the edge, velo uh, edge velocity divided by the height or the thickness of the boundary layer right okay of course if you have a, a general profile there is going to be a constant coming out of this right it's going to be usually the boundary layer curves so uh, the, the wall shear stress is actually a factor higher than this, like 
twice as high or something like that. All right, make sense? Okay. Then we started uh, really our analysis. So first of all, we were asking how much mass flows across a cross-sectional uh, of delta times b per second. So we are really looking at what is the mass flow between here and here for a span of b, right? And uh, uh, the result is that because the average velocity in this region is actually half as fast as the free stream velocity u infinity, right? So we have a factor of half over here. The half is really multiplied down u infinity. And then you multiply by a delta times b, which is the cross-sectional area, then multiply by density. That's the mass flow rate. A any questions on that? Then we look at how much momentum flows across that cross-section, okay? And momentum flux, different from mass flux, is proportional not to the velocity itself, but to the square of the velocity. Why is that? That's because momentum is equal to mass times velocity, right? And the amount of mass that flows through a particular area by itself is proportional to velocity. So. There is a velocity in the mass flow, and then there is another velocity in mass times velocity equal to momentum. That gives us a u infinity squared. I mean, that gives us a u squared. And then if you integrate u squared, right, where u uh, satisfies this linear profile, you get a y squared. And you're integrating y squared, you get a y cubed, and that cancels with the delta squared uh, when you look at u squared. So basically, what you get is this number. A third comes from the integral of y squared. But if you integrate a squared function, you get a one third. Uh, any questions on that? Then, uh, from what we were doing in the last lecture, I think there was a lot of uh, confusion regarding to the momentum defect. In particular, why we are looking at this momentum defect. So let me explain a little bit more uh, in this lecture, right? Okay, so the reason we are looking at momentum defect is because it is very convenient for a conservation of momentum analysis. So let me exaggerate a little bit and uh, uh, draw a control volume. So the control volume goes from here. Uh, let me use a different color, actually. The control volume goes from here to here. OK, I'm calling this dx. dx is a very small uh, delta length, but just uh, for me to draw it uh, well, I made it uh, pretty long, right? But just imagine dx is actually infinitesimally small. Now, the top of the control volume is actually what? It's actually a curved, uh, it's actually a, a line that does not align with the streamline. Right? Just imagine if this curve, if this edge of the boundary layer aligns with a streamline, then, well, mass cannot be conserved, right? Then if you, if you draw a control volume like this, nothing flows into the control volume, but something flows out. Do you agree? So, so this edge of the boundary layer cannot be a streamline. Now, for mass to be conserved, does flow have to go into this boundary layer or out of the boundary layer A at this edge? Into, right? Because there is flow coming out on that side, and uh, there is no flow on the wall, right? But the, by definition, it's a wall. So flow has to go into the boundary layer from the top in order for some flow to come out from the right-hand side. All right, that's conservation of mass. OK, so now let me draw two streamlines that ends over here and ends over here. 
that uh, uh, that actually follows a streamline. So this is a streamline, and uh, this is another streamline. What I want to say is that look at this region bounded by the two streamlines and the top of the boundary layer. How does conservation of momentum work within this control volume? Think about the conservation of momentum. It's actually very simple because what is the velocity within that region? within that whole region. You infinity, right? The velocity does not change at all. The x velocity doesn't change at all. So if you look at the uh, conservation of momentum, and there is no pressure, right? So ignore pressure. The pressure is constant. So pressure doesn't contribute to anything. And then there is no flux of momentum through this edge and this edge because they are streamlines, right? Rho, uh, u dot n is equal to 0, so no flux. The only flux is over here and over here. So whatever momentum goes into this green control volume comes from here. Agreed? OK. So that means in order for me to uh, figure out the conservation of momentum in this green region, right? I need uh, uh, this green region conveniently has four sides. So I need four numbers. One number is the momentum flux over the bottom. Although there is no flow actually goes through it, there is viscous force, right? There is no viscous force over here and over here because the flow velocity is uniform. They are all in infinity, so there is no viscous force. But over here, there is. There is a velocity gradient, all right? Uh, the momentum flux over here which is equal to the momentum flux over here minus its defect, right? We are defining the momentum defect to be how much momentum has lost when the flow goes from here to over here, right? So the momentum flux over here is the momentum flux in this region upstream minus its momentum defect. Agreed? Okay. How about the momentum flux over here? It is equal to the momentum flux over here in the wider region upstream minus its momentum defect. All right. So let me let me write it out. Let me write it out. The momentum flux. Um, let's write the momentum flux as m one, right, over here. And let's write the momentum flux upstream as a capital M1. Let's write the momentum flux over on the right-hand side as M2, and uh, the momentum flux upstream in the corresponding stream tube to be capital M2. And do you agree that M2 minus M1 is exactly how much momentum that flows into the top? OK, so essentially, uh, that means if I know that m1, small m1 is equal to capital M1 minus the defect d1, and small m2 is equal to capital M2 minus d2, okay? And what flows from the top is actually capital M2 minus capital M1. Then all the capital M's actually exactly cancels out in the momentum balance. All right? So what flows in, uh, what flows into the control volume has a capital M1, but it also has a minus capital M1, right? Okay. What flows into the control volume has a capital M2, but what flows out of the control volume also has a capital M2. So both capital M1 and capital M2 cancels out. The only thing left is the defects d1 and d2. They have a minus sign. Right? I mean, th this is the reason why we focus on the defect, right, rather than the momentum flux itself. And this actually happens uh, in all boundary layer analysis.
uh, if you take the subsequent course, uh, uh, like, well, there are <laughs> there are multiple subsequent courses. There is uh, uh, there is a uh, uh, sixteen one ten the uh, aerodynamics of flight vehicles. There is also the viscous uh, flow course uh, in subsequent. Uh, like if you, if you go to take graduate school classes, uh, the boundary layer analysis is all about defects. There is mass flux defect. There is momentum flux defect. There is also energy flux defect. Uh, it's a uh, like we look at boundary layers or from the point of view of the defects exactly because whatever conservation law you are looking at, right? You the you can trace it back to the free stream and whatever that is in the free stream actually cancels out. So in the balance, you only get the defects. A any questions regarding to this, uh, the, the reason why, again, we're looking at the defect? Yes? What is the defect Oh, the, the defect is, uh, is defined by this formula, right? D1 is defined to be the difference between the momentum flux upstream in the same corresponding uh, stream tube minus the momentum flux uh, like downstream over here. It's looking at the same the same stream tube and look at okay from here to here how much momentum flux has lost during the process. So D1 is defined as big M1 minus small m1. Uh, D2 is defined as big M2 minus small m2. All right. It's conveniently happens that all the capital ones actually cancels out in the momentum analysis, just because the difference between m2 and m1 actually feeds into that control volume. Any, any other questions? Okay, so so maybe let's write down the conservation of momentum, right? The conservation of momentum basically says that the uh, the influx in momentum minus the outflux in the momentum, right, has to balance whatever force is on the control volume. So the influx in momentum again is uh, from the top. From the top is is big M2 minus big M1, right? So that's the top. And the, from the left, it's M1 minus D1, right? That's where how M1 goes cancelled out. And that's from the left. And then minus the outflux from the right, which is big M2 minus D2, right? So that's how big M2 get cancelled out. Agreed? Okay, and that uh, has to equal to the amount of force, right? So uh, in, in this case, we are going to see that uh, the influx is going to have more momentum than the outflux. Okay, so the force has to be negative, right? The force has to go towards the left to balance out. Right, so so that uh, basically that has to equal to the amount of uh, leftward force on this control volume, and we know that is uh, equal to tau times uh, the area, which is dx times b, the span. All right, makes sense. So uh, now let's actually just cancel out the big M's and write it down only as a function of the small m's. So we just get d2 minus d1, right? Okay, and we already figured out d2 minus d1, right? I mean, this is really the definition of uh, the d's, the momentum defects, right? The, the amount of momentum flux upstream minus the amount of momentum downstream, right? It is equal to one-sixth of rho delta b u infinity squared. So basically, that is equal to, I will just write down everything that's constant over here. So rho, one sixth of rho uh, b u infinity squared. Now, the only thing different between station two and station one is the delta, right? The thickness of the boundary layer has changed. So 
I'll write d delta, the amount of change over here. All right, any questions regarding that? Now we see this equation actually relates the change in the thickness to a change in the x location, right? It describes, as I move downstream with the dx, how much the boundary layer grows in its thickness, d delta. And uh, let's just uh, uh, cancel out the b's, right? So, so essentially, uh, basically, we have answered the question total x momentum flux and the total external force, right? And uh, let me just uh, write down the external force in terms of uh, uh, these variables. So, so tau is equal to mu times u infinity divided by delta. So we have uh, mu u infinity divided by delta times b times dx. All right, and uh, uh, of course we already said that b should cancel out uh, because it always appears on both sides of the equation no matter what kind of a balance you are looking at. So the resulting equation we get uh, is, let's just cancel another u infinity over here. So the equation we get is mu dx over delta, right? So that's the left hand side. The, the, uh, the fourth part is equal to one sixth of rho u infinity. The square cancels with the u infinity on the left hand side, d delta. All right. Any questions so far? That's the simplest equation we can get. The next is really to write it into fractional sensitivity form. Right? Okay, so we, we look at proportionally as I increase in x, how much delta do I get? So let's actually uh, write it down over here. Uh, not the correct uh, space, but I will just uh, write uh, dx over x, right? In order to make up uh, uh, the x over here, we get another mu x delta, right? That's the left hand side equal to the right hand side uh, one sixth rho u infinity uh, over delta uh, not, not over delta uh, times delta uh, times d delta over delta so that's a fractional sensitivity form and just to, to move things around my d delta over delta can be written as oh sorry I should always write rho in that way right uh, rho should be written a little bit yeah, uh, let me just uh, add a tail so that uh, we know what we are looking at. Okay, that's it. And the d delta over delta is equal to, let me just, uh, uh, I don't even need to write equal to, I can just uh, say it's proportional to because I don't want to carry the one sixth. And the one sixth is actually not precise anyway, right? If you uh, if you plug in an actual boundary layer profile rather than this linear one, you're gonna get the different number as one sixth. So, so uh, write the, this as proportional to rho. Uh, one second, rho should be underneath. Uh, proportional to mu, right? We have x, and underneath we have rho u infinity and uh, delta squared. Uh, is that right? Delta squared uh, or the other way, let me see. Times uh, dx over x, right? Okay, so here we get this relation in fractional sensitivity. And what is really important, right, is this number over here. This number tells me how delta grow proportionally as x increases proportionally. If this number, for example, is less than 1, 
if this number is significantly less than one, then essentially what uh, I'm saying is that as x increases proportionally, delta would not increase in proportion at all, right? So, so for example, if this, this number is less than half, if this number is less, less than half, uh, including the proportionality constant, what happens would be that delta, the increase in delta would be less than half <coughs> as much as the increment in x. And if you square delta, you would see that delta square would increase proportionally less than the increase in x. And the result is, if you look at x divided by delta square, that number would actually increase because delta square would increase less fast than x, right? On the other hand, if this uh, proportional sensitivity, including the constant, is greater than half, what it turns out is that delta square is going to increase in a faster rate proportionally than x, right? And this number would then decrease. D does that make sense? So this proportional sensitivity or fractional sensitivity has a negative feedback on itself, right? So, so if this number is significantly less than half, right, it'll increase until it becomes about half. If this number is significantly more than half, this number is going to decrease until it reaches half. So no matter what proportionality constant uh, we have, we are going to have this number right, without the proportionality constant approaching order one, right? This number cannot be on the order of like 0 0.001. It cannot be on the order of like a thousand, right? It has to approach order one no matter what, no matter what the proportionality constant is going to be, if it's one six or six or whatever. All right, so that means This number over here stabilizes itself. To order one. And this is where one of the most fundamental number, Reynolds number, comes from. For example, you can re you can rewrite this right. You can rewrite this into uh, if this is on the order one. That's how I I usually write it. That means like it is order one. That means if you move if you move uh, some part of it onto the right hand side. If you move this to the right hand side, uh, this and this to the to the right hand side, and uh, uh, one of the usual things we do is you also put an x over here and square the x, right? So, so essentially, you're moving also this to the left hand side. What you get, what you obtain, is that rho u infinity x divided by mu. That's what I have moved to the left hand side. Is going to be on the order of x over delta squared. Okay, this is actually one of the most fundamental geometric relations of a laminar boundary layer. On the left hand side is the Reynolds number, right? We have density, velocity <coughs> times a spatial length, the distance from the leading edge to the location where I'm looking at the boundary layer, right? So that's what x is. These three multiplied together actually have the same dimension as the dynamic viscosity. Okay, now if I divide that, I get what's known as the Reynolds number. Now, in most uh, aerodynamic flows of like usual uh, sites. Because the viscosity of air is really small, it's on the order of 10 to the minus 5. And the density is on the order of 1, 1 kilogram per meter cubed. And the velocity, if you look at anything uh, 
interesting, it'll be pretty fast, right? So this is uh, so velocity is large x. I mean, if you're looking at big things, it's big. Even small things, so wouldn't be that small. Uh, and once you divide by the viscosity, it's something pretty large. Now that large Reynolds number, usually on the order of uh, uh, at least uh, uh, tens of thousands, right, is actually going to be on the order of the square of x divided by delta. Or another way to uh, say it is that delta divided by x is on the order as 1 over square root of the Reynolds number. Right? Just to flip it over and take a square root. So this basically tells you how thin boundary layers usually are. Okay, and that just comes out of this momentum balance analysis and the fractional sensitivity. Basically, we looked at how the boundary layer would grow, right? As I, uh, as as it suffers from this skin friction underneath, right? I mean, the the only reason it grows is because it has a skin friction, right? I mean, if if tau is equal to zero, uh, there is no reason. D2 has to be more than D1, right? The boundary layer wouldn't grow. So, so basically, from here, we, uh, we figured out the fractional sensitivity of uh, dx over x and uh, d delta over delta. And uh, uh, from that fractional sensitivity, we concluded that this fractional sensitivity has to be order 1. Actually, including the constant, it stabilizes itself at equal to half, right? Okay, because just because there is a square over here and the x has no square. And from there, we derived the Reynolds number being on the same order as x over delta squared. And which means that <laughs> delta over x, or the proportional thickness of the boundary layer is on the order of 1 over the square root of Reynolds number. So if you have Reynolds number of a million, okay, usually how thin is the boundary layer? Assuming it's laminar, right? We'll study turbulence a little bit later on. So, so uh, uh, we are going to see that a turbulent boundary layer actually satisfies exactly the same kind of analysis, except for the profile, the boundary layer profile is has a very very sharp gradient at the bottom so the proportionality constant actually uh, can become pretty huge right so that kind of uh, determines why uh, uh, turbulent boundary layers deviates from this analysis uh, just because this proportionality constant becomes very very far from order one but the same analysis actually applies Okay, uh, if we have a laminar boundary layer, and uh, basically the, the profile is, is not too different from this uh, linear profile, and uh, uh, this law applies, if Reynolds number is a milling, how thin is the boundary layer? It's like a thousandth, right, of the distance to the leading edge. All right. So, so that means like boundary layers are usually very, very thick. Okay. And and this actually determines one of the uh, most uh, important flow regimes we'll be looking at. That's inviscid flow. Okay. Why we are looking at inviscid flow? We are looking at inviscid flow just because. If I have an aerodynamic body with no flow separation, so the boundary layer attaches with the body, then the thickness of the boundary layer can be ignored to some extent, right? And we can just look at the flow, the flow field outside of the boundary layer as if the thickness of the boundary layer is zero, as if there is no boundary layer at all. And the flow out of the boundary layer is considered as inviscid flow, right? Because the uh, the viscosity outside of the boundary layer doesn't matter that much. 
and exactly how much error you are making right by assuming the flow is inviscid comes from this right the amount of error you are making is essentially 1 over square root of the Reynolds number because what you are essentially what you're actually looking at is a flow field with a boundary layer on top of the geometry but you're assuming that doesn't exist right so this is how much error you are making Coming back to the Mach number, right? Mach number has an effect proportional to m squared, right? How much error you are making by assuming things are incompressible is m squared. So Mach 0.1, you are making 1% error. On the other hand, Reynolds number has a square root effect. Okay, and actually considering turbulence, it's actually more than one over square root for higher Reynolds numbers when you are uh, have turbulent flows in the boundary layer. So, so essentially, uh, let's say this this law is pretty consistent uh, when you have a Reynolds number uh, less than less than a hundred thousand, right? Or or well, when you don't have a transition to turbulence in the boundary layer. So, so how much error you would be making is uh, can be roughly estimated by one over the square root of Reynolds number. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so these are the two most important non-dimensional numbers in aerodynamics, actually. I mean, there are other non-dimensional numbers when you consider other effects. But if you, if you uh, just consider pure aerodynamic forces you ignore for, for example gravitational forces which well if you're flying fast enough it doesn't matter at all to the motion of air I mean it matters to the motion of the airplane but to the motion of the air gravity doesn't matter uh, at all because air is much much lighter right and, and if you fly fast enough uh, gravity doesn't matter so the only two non-dimensional numbers in aerodynamics is the Mach number defined as velocity I mean, usually we uh, look at u infinity that's how fast the things are flying uh, actually let me just uh, make it squared uh, just to make it uh, uh, obvious that's that's what actually matters right and another one let me just uh, call it uh, square root of Reynolds number just to, to be consistent is equal to the square root of rho u infinity uh, the length scale, right? Let me just uh, write L. It can be, uh, for example, if you're looking at a wing, uh, you should be looking at uh, the maximum distance from the location of the boundary layer to the leading edge. So that is the chord length, right? And if you're looking at the fuselage, it's the length of the fuselage. So whatever length scale that's important, divide it by the viscosity. And when the Mach number is much, much less than 1, the flow is incompressible. Okay, and on the other hand, when the Reynolds number is much, much greater than 1, okay, the flow can be considered uh, in viscous or in viscid. Oh, yeah, it's the same, same thing. All right, so uh, that that kind of defines what we are going to be looking at in after we introduce uh, the fundamental concepts. That's we are, we'll be first looking at incompressible and inviscid flow, and then uh, in the second half of the semester we'll start looking at compressible effects and uh, viscous effects. Okay, uh, uh, so. So these two numbers also defines uh, different flow behaviors. So if you look at the Navier-Stokes equation, if you can match these two numbers, okay, the equations are exactly the same. So essentially, what it means is that if you do the proper scaling of all the variables, right? So if, for example, the momentum equation, if you write uh, uh, d 
if you write down the momentum equation. That is d rho u dt, uh, this is rho as a vector, plus the divergence of, this is actually called the tensor product of uh, velocity and the times rho, plus the gradient of pressure is equal to uh, the divergence of viscous forces, right? The viscous forces, uh, uh, it's, let's just uh, write down as mu times the shear, uh, the shear rate. The shear rate is proportional to the derivative of velocity. I mean, we are going to look at uh, uh, pretty soon, like why, uh, what that uh, shear, shear rate tensor is like. Okay, so if you look at this, and if you redefine everything in terms of its non-dimensional quantities. So for example, instead of a velocity, I define non-dimensional velocity, right? Uh, I define a non-dimensional velocity, let's say I write as u bar, also as a vector, defined as the velocity divided by let me also write this as infinity, the, the, uh, the density at, at free stream. So if I, if I define the velocity as the velocity divided by the square root of not the local pressure, but the, uh, not the local speed of sound, but the speed of sound at free stream, okay, I define the density as the density divided by the density at the free stream. Okay, I define the pressure as, um, well, in this case, uh, it's a little bit different. I, I define the pressure as the P, the local pressure, divided by, um, because I already know that uh, I, I already have a speed of sound. Well, I can, I can also divide it by the pressure at infinity. And, uh, uh, the equations, if I write it down, would only depend on the non-dimensional quantities as opposed to the quantities such as uh, air viscosity, right? So all the dimensional quantities would vanish from the equation, and I would have an equation that only depends on Mach number and the Reynolds number. So what that does that mean is that if I have two different flow scenarios, Okay, and these two different scenarios actually has exactly the matching Mach number and the Reynolds number. The behavior of the flow is going to be exactly the same. Exact, not the same, but exactly similar in terms of these non-dimensional quantities. Okay, to, to exercise this insight, let's actually uh, figure out a particular scenario that is how to test a Martian helicopter on Earth. Okay, so here what I'm what I'm uh, like we probably all know this uh, Ingenuity helicopter, right? Uh, this is just uh, some the of original its plan most for recent the Ingenuity updates. helicopter was just to show that it could actually fly on Mars, not survive a Martian winter. So returning to flight after months of overnight lows in the minus 120s was a gamble on this episode of Mars Guy. Ingenuity first took flight 16 months ago on an early spring day, or SOL, in the northern hemisphere of Mars. Now it's the middle of winter with daytime highs in the single digits below zero and lows more than 100 degrees colder. Starting a few months ago, the low sun angle and dusty skies sapped the input on Ingenuity's solar panel to the point that its batteries could no longer power the survival heaters overnight. Here's Mars Guy for scale. None of its electronics is rated for the resulting nightly cold soaks, and its batteries are not fully charging. So after more than a hundred of these nights, Ingenuity's 30th flight was more like an early test flight than the epic flights at the height of its power. Ingenuity checked in on Sol 503, sending three close-up images from its color camera that spanned 48 seconds at about 12.50 in the afternoon. The tiny shifts in its shadow shows that the camera still works and that Mars does indeed spin on its axis.
on SOL 527, it sent back two NavCam images from before and after a test of its rotors, spinning them up to the more than 2500 RPM needed for flight. The telemetry indicated ingenuity was go for flight, so on SOL 533, August 19th on Earth, Ingenuity took to the skies. This video is from Ingenuity's 14th flight, which was essentially an equivalent one. It also climbed to 5 meters, then flew sideways, or translated, 2 meters before landing. With the new flight, there's hope that some of the dust on the solar panel will be cleared off. Only three NavCam images of the actual flight have been downlinked, which show the controlled descent. Although this flight only moved two meters closer to Perseverance, there's no concern that Ingenuity will fall behind. Perseverance is on the move again after more than two months exploring and sampling rocks at the front of the ancient delta. But its next destination is taking it backward. The rocks in a location dubbed Enchanted Lake that it visited months ago but didn't sample will get a second look in the coming weeks. Here's the latest view looking back at the location where Perseverance collected its four most recent rock samples. The view ahead includes the spectacular mesa named Kodiak, an eroded remnant of the delta. And hidden from view by nearby terrain are the rocks of Enchanted Lake. Here they are in the views from the first visit in late April of this year, which I presented in episode 57. It's the thin layers that make these rocks appealing. They're the result of fine sediments deposited on the floor of ancient Lake Jezero, or Yezero. So they could host the preserved remains of microbial life that may have inhabited the lake. Returning to these rocks months later, like Ingenuity's return to flight, is a bit like starting over. All right, so Let's do an exercise uh, from uh, groups of two or three people and uh, let's figure out if you want to test the equivalent of an uh, Ingenuity helicopter on Earth, on like standard atmosphere, right? How big of a test article do you want to build and uh, how fast uh, should this motor spin? These are all the quantities uh, I'm giving as a uh, as as basically the condition on Mars, right? So now you guys figure out if I want to test this in standard uh, atmosphere, sea level on Earth, what would you do? All right, let's let's go. So, so I think everybody, almost everybody got it right uh, or is on the way to get it right. Uh, so you see the tip velocity, right? Uh, on Earth is uh, not too crazy. It's 200 something meters per second, okay? Uh, but the length scale, the diameter of the rotor you need to test it on Earth is tiny, right? And as a result of that, the RPM is huge. Right, everybody got something like that, right? I mean, that's the reason uh, why uh, GPL did not make a scaled model and uh, tested the at atmosphere pressure, right? They, to match the renal number, they actually sucked most of the air out of the uh, testing chamber. So it's uh, almost a vacuum. Your density becomes much smaller so that in order to match the same renal number, you can afford to have a larger diameter all right make sense okay so that's uh, uh that's basically uh everything that underlies 
testing, like scaled model testing, right? If you want to test something somewhere and it's infeasible to replicate exactly the same condition, you replicate the same Mach number, same Reynolds number. And we also have said that when the Mach number is small enough, it doesn't matter, right? So if something is supposed to operate at a low Mach number, then it doesn't matter even you match the Mach number. Also, we have said, said that the Reynolds number, if it's big enough, it doesn't matter. So if something is supposed to operate at a really high Reynolds number, then again, it doesn't matter that much to match the Reynolds number. This is a particular case in which both the Reynolds number and the Mach number matters. Right? The Reynolds number you guys calculated are usually Reynolds number based on the diameter or radius. Right? That turns out to be uh, like on the order of 100,000. 100, right? But if you look at the Reynolds number based on the core length, it's actually even smaller. And if you take the square root, it's not that big. Okay? So, so everything actually matters in this particular case. And that led to our discussion on the so-called flow regimes. So we have general aerodynamics that's viscous and compressible. And at high enough Reynolds number, we can make the <coughs> inviscid assumption because all the boundary layers are, are thin, right? And if the, uh, if the body is aerodynamic, there is no flow separation and all the boundary layers are attached, you can approximate the flow outside of the boundary layer as inviscid. Okay, so that's, that's basically high Reynolds number approximation. Or you can make a low Mach approximation. So that will lead you to incompressible but viscous equations. Okay? And uh, uh, we'll talk about the boundary layer a little bit uh, uh, later because uh, that involves another type of approximation. It's uh, called a thin layer approximation. So basically, the boundary layer is thin enough so that uh, most of the velocity goes along the wall. And the velocity normal to the wall is so tiny that you can ignore some of the terms in the momentum equation. Okay? And then next, we'll be looking at another set of approximations. Right? This approximation is exactly the same. So incompressible, from incompressible viscid to incompressible inviscid, that's another high Reynolds number approximation. But this approximation be, uh, between compressible inviscid and the compressible potential flow has to do with the absence of vorticity. So basically, that's an approximation of zero vorticity. And uh, starting from our next lecture, we'll, we'll discuss what is so special about this thing called the vorticity that allows us to consider the majority of compressible inviscid flow and the incompressible inviscid flow right, as potential flow. Right? So, so basically, again, uh, from here to here is zero uh, viscosity, omega is uh, how I usually denote viscosity. And again, from compressible to incompressible potential flow, that's basically a low Mach uh, assumption. Right? So, so we've seen that. A lot of these different flow regimes, as you go lower, it's simpler, it's easier to understand, and it's faster to calculate. Okay? And the reason we can make a lot of these approximations, one is, I mean, it's obvious what is high Reynolds number, what is low Mach number, right? But what cases can I consider a zero vorticity flow? That's something we'll start discussing next week. All right, so I'll see you next week and uh, uh, start to look at uh, uh, flow kinematics and uh, vorticity and circulation.